uh, for our opportunity to come and study his word, his precious word. Uh, so um, let us go before the Lord in a word of prayer and uh, open up and then we're going to try to allow the Lord to teach us this morning what, what we can learn. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your blessings. Thank you, dear Lord, for uh, loving us so much that you would send your son to die in our place to redeem our souls, uh, for we were in sin and on our way to a Christless eternity. And so, Father, we thank you for uh, shedding your precious blood for us. And, Father, we thank you for giving us hope. We thank you for whatever we're going through today, as Michael said, that, that we know that you are still on the throne. So, Father, we pray that as we study this morning, uh, about uh, the Christian and, and government. Uh, we pray that you would lead us, guide us, direct our way uh, through your word. Lead us by your spirit. Uh, I pray for uh, the energy we need to study and to be alert and to learn and that we may uh, uh, be able to pray and to uh, apply the things that you teach us as we go throughout our, our day and throughout the week. Thank you for what you're doing. We pray that you would continue to bless and to bring souls to yourself, to make yourself known to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, we've been looking at the uh, role of the believer in Christ and relationship uh, to, of the church to, to civil government. And so if you have your book, The uh, Doctrines... Bible doctrines, uh, if you would turn to page 206, uh, we want to um, do a bit of refresher on where we were last week and, um, and then continue in our study of the relationship of the church to civil government. It, uh, in the book, it talks about the early church was a persecuted church. And yet it thrived. Sometimes the persecution arose from the religious leaders of the Jewish Sanhedrin. And uh, that's uh, recorded in uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And at other times it arose from oppression from hostile governments, a hostile government, as we see in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. During the um, period when Paul or, or Luke wrote the book of Acts and, and during the period when the apostles lived, they went through a period of uh, persecution. And, and the, uh, it's recorded here that history records 10 periods of Roman persecution beginning with Nero and ending with Diocletian. And if I can start getting my clicker to work right, I'll be okay. Um, it points out, points out that although, and so there's a period, I don't remember how long it was, 300 years of persecution in the church, in the, in the first century church. And it goes on to say that although few would suggest the church in America today suffers as the early church did, it is important that we understand the church's relationship to government. I want to ask you a question. It makes that statement that although few would suggest that the church in America today suffers as the early church did. Um, is there still persecution going on? It is, is it as bad today as it was back then? Some of you say no. It depends on where you live? Okay. So where, is it, where, did, where does it depend on where you live? What, what countries are bad? Muslim countries? So you're saying foreign countries. It's terrible. In some places, persecution 
in, in the uh, 19th and 20th century has been as uh, more than it was even in the first, first three centuries alone. More people have died. Uh, you, you, and that's the thing about it. We don't hear about it so much here because we're sort of insulated in America. But in places in Africa or places um, communist countries, in, communist countries in, in Muslim countries, as someone said, uh, persecution is rampant. People are being thrown in jail. You can't carry a Bible. You can't, you can't talk about Christ. They call it proselytizing. They'll throw you in jail or worse. So although it's not bad here, it's bad here. It's bad. And that's why we need to pray for these persecuted countries and persecuted believers. Um, I found that a lot of the genocide that takes place uh, when we hear about uh, people being killed in Africa has a lot oftentimes has to do with religious persecution. Because people are believers and they turn uh, and the Muslim countries fight against them. Some of you may, may remember not too long ago this summer. The man came from Central Arab, Central African Republic. And he came, he talked to us about it. And he said he was going back because the Muslims are taking over the, the country. And they uh, are teaching, they have schools, and the Christians don't have many schools. And so the kids, when they go to school, they have to go to a Muslim school. And that's one of the reasons why he wanted to go back to help his people or help the people there to, um, to learn about Christ. But they were keeping him out. And I haven't heard an update of whether he, uh, whether he was able to get back or not. I'm planning to send him an email message or something. But um, we were sending him the contributions, but I haven't heard. But, but the point is, is that, yes, there is persecution going on in other countries. So it's not as bad here, but keep your eyes awake. Uh, keep looking and praying because it is taking place. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran. Uh, there was a, a, a pre preacher in Iran that was being thrown in jail just for preaching the gospel. So yes, it is still going on. Um, how long would it last, this persecution? Till Christ returns. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 for a moment. And if you have it, please read it loud. loud. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Okay. So John testifies that he was sent to the Isle of Patmos. Why? He was being persecuted, uh, banished. For what reason? Preaching the gospel. He says, for the word of God. And what other reason? That's right. He testified about Christ. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And would someone read that out loud? And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they gave. Okay. You, okay, so we see that during the tribulation period, Revelation 6-9, uh, And we see again that during the tribulation period and the great tribulation, 
that when the fifth seal was opened, he saw under the altar souls of them that were slain. For what reason? For the word of God. Same reason that John was, was banished for the Isle of Patmos. And that's what's going to happen during the tribulation period as well. That's what he's saying. When the fifth seal was opened, fifth seal hasn't been opened yet. Okay, the seal judgments haven't happened yet. They're going to happen. That's future. So persecution will be here. Souls will go on the persecution for the testimony of Christ. Excuse me, that was part of me. We got it short somewhere. Um, but souls will go, uh, go through persecution um, during the um, during the tribulation period. Now, we want to see. We we talked about um, God instituting government for the welfare of man, and we said that after the fall of man it became evident that mankind could not live in harmony in harmony if conscience was the only guide okay now if, to understand this you have to understand dispensational theology and in dispensational theology um, it said that man lived first um, he was in innocence before the fall. Man lived in innocence. And um, after the fall, he lived by what? Somebody said it. It, it wasn't grace at that point. Conscience. Conscience. He lived by conscience. And his conscience told him what was right and wrong. Okay, his conscience told him what was right and wrong. And so uh, it's pointed out here that after the fall of man, it became evident that mankind could not live in harmony if conscience was his only guide. If all he had to go by was what was right and wrong, we found that man would always do wrong. Uh, maybe you had some cattle out in the field back in those days. And you wake up one morning, go looking for your cattle, they're gone. Why? Somebody didn't respect you. They, they took your cattle. Um, uh, of course, nothing's changed because we don't, may not be cattle. It may be something else. People still steal and kill and maim. So he found that conscience wasn't enough. So it says, for 16 centuries, acts of violence grew to such proportions that God had to send a worldwide flood in order to purge this world of the results of man's passions. And it gives us a scripture. It says, after the flood, God established civil government by instituting the death penalty, capital punishment for murder. And if you turn with us to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Matter of fact, before we go to Genesis 9, 6, I would like for you to turn to Genesis chapter 6. And look at verse 5, just so we get an idea of what God saw when he made the decision to destroy the world. And could somebody read verses 5 through 7 for us, please?
And Sister Mary, would you read verse 8? Thank you. Amen. Somebody mentioned grace earlier. Uh, at that time, man didn't live by grace. Well, God did. God, God so found grace um, in, the, in, in the eyes of Noah or upon the eyes of Noah. And, and so we see that uh, it was only wickedness going through the earth. So God decided to destroy the earth. And if we go back now to chapter 9, verse 6, we see now that God introduces a different element to help man to rule himself. And if we begin with verse 5, verse 5 through 9, please. If someone would read that for us. Okay, thank you very much. And so we see now God introduces a different element. He says that, verse 5, Surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. So... What he and it goes on to clarify what he's saying here in verse six. It says, "Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed." And he tells why. Interesting, for in the image of God made he man. So what is he saying in all of that? Uh, when he says, surely your blood of your lives will I require. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, shall his blood be shed. What is God saying? If you kill somebody, your life will be required to pay the debt. Is that right? You shall be killed. Life for life. It's that's interesting, Gerald. I, I because I sometimes wonder if we still have capital punishment. Uh, the it, it, what does this show when God says your life is required because of the image of God? What is He saying? We talked about that a little bit last week. But just for a refresher, what is God saying? Your life is, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. You hear that? Okay. Any disagreement with that? Um, and Michael made a good point last week, too. Um, he... Uh, do you remember what you said? We talked about it a little bit yesterday. Kind of. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you. Right. 
Right. You see, what I got from what he was saying was that we now see God even as less relevant. Okay, we're t we're taking God is less relevant. You know, back in the 60s, they used to even go as far as say God is dead. Some of you grew up back then. I'm not the only one. You remember. <laughs> uh, exactly. That's the point. That's true. Just like just like that, too. So, yes. Go ahead. I believe he is. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, the, one of the things about the image of God is that it's not always defined in Scripture exactly what image of God is. But we have an idea because we learn more and more of what God is like. And as we learn more and more what God is like, we see how he's created us. Okay? And so think about what happens in this country. We have, I mean, who set up government? Who made the world? God did. He made the very people that are saying he's irrelevant. He gives, them, he gives us our breath, our sight, our blood running through. We didn't even think about it. It just happens. And he provides. So now we've gotten to the point to say that the laws that God gave in the, in the American courts, courtrooms, are, are, are the Ten Commandments. We don't need them in the courtroom. We don't need, um, we can just violate the law he says and says that men, and, men can marry men and women can marry women. And you can marry animals if you want to. Who knows what's coming next? Because we've pushing God out the side. We're saying that we have on our currency and God we trust. People want to get rid of that. Uh, we used to be able to pray in the classroom or read the scriptures. When I came up, that's what we did. And but they got rid of that. But let some tragedy happen. You see how much praying is going on in the classroom. But my point is, you get the point, and that's why I thought Michael's comment was so important. Because the more we de devalue God, we're really devaluing ourselves. And as we devalue ourselves, life becomes less important. We see murders, we, we re just read about murders going on like they're nothing. Kids going out, doing other things to other kids, and kidnappings and everything. Because we don't respect God, and even the government is getting into it when you talk about capital punishment. Because, and I realize that there were errors. Errors are made. But think about if they did it God's way. If the person who's a witness to say that person, he's the one who killed, who, who, who killed the person. So therefore, they're, they're going to execute him. And years later, they find out, well, that was, he was the wrong man. Yeah. Well, what happens now if you were the witness and you got to give your life? You think it'll make a difference? I think so. You see, it doesn't work the way God set it up. And not only that, uh, uh, Deacon Shelton came up, oh, excuse me, Pastor Shelton. Uh, came to me after the service last week, after we studied this, and he pointed out that there were cities of refuge, if you recall, so that if a person struck somebody by accident, that he could get to one of the cities of refuge until they could make judgment. So God has set up a system. Okay, the problem is we don't execute it. We don't follow it. So, so that's, that's one of the issues that we have. Yes, yes, Belair. Could it also be uh, we have to prove that um, well, there was no fear of God, that's that is, uh, but also to we have some of the same God without some of the 
sure. Yeah. Isn't that what, uh, I believe that's what humanism is, isn't it? Uh, it, it, another form of replacing God, uh, putting man on the pedal. Sometimes I wonder if that's what's happened with our own government. Why is this functional? Because it's certainly not functioning the way God set it up. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, it says, God again taught the sanctity of human life and reminding us of the reason for his value. Man was made in the image of God. Human life is so precious to God that a murderer must forfeit his life at the hands of God's delegated authority. God ordained that men should establish laws to restrain the evil which had accelerated since man's fall. And that's the reason why he set up human government. It was to help man, to benefit man. And the author gives us a Christian view. Oh, this is, I want to come back to this about the uh, Uh, in the book, the author points out, would somebody read a Christian view? You see that? If you have Utopian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's a quote by Robert D. Culver uh, in his book, Toward the Biblical View of Civil Government. And what it's saying, I believe what it's saying, is that government is not perfect. The way, that's what I get from it. Um, it's a Christian view of civil government must always steadily, constantly hold the fact that human society is a society of fallen beings under the just judgment of God, which is why capital punishment doesn't work uh, the way that God designed it, because we don't follow it the way God designed it. Um, and we make compromises. God is a righteous God. He doesn't he doesn't bow to somebody because they can offer him a bribe or pay him off, you know, uh, as, as the courts do, or, or you know, give unrighteous judgments. Brother Bill? Our government uses taxpayer money to pay Planned Parenthood to murder babies. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's true. It's... Um, That's true, yeah. The uh, And that's why, that was the whole, I think that's why the author put that little comment in there, is that uh, government is just, it's not, it's not the way God designed it, it's fallen. It's fallen. And um, one of the things that, I want to uh, perhaps reiterate is going back to the idea that um, God created government. Turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 10.
Let's see, is it the right one? Trying to see if I got the right one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Proverbs chapter 8. Uh, chapter 8, verse 15 and 16. Apologize. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. If you have it, please read it. Okay. Now, Solomon's talking here about wisdom. But when you look in the New Testament to find out who wisdom is, you see that wisdom is Christ. Um, I didn't write down the scriptures to, sh to prove that, but if you turn to, well, if you have a question, believe in it, see me after service. We'll, we'll, we'll find the scriptures. But, but uh, Colossians and <coughs> Philippians talk about Christ is wisdom. Um, the, the point here is that he says, uh, it is by me. By, Christ created all things. By him all things consist, are held together. So he says that it is by me that kings reign and rulers enact just laws. And by me princes lead and do nobles as do nobles and all righteous judges. Uh, also turn to Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 75. Psalm 75, verses... Six and seven. Could somebody read that one for us? Okay. He is the one who sets up kings and brings down kings. Okay. Um, Daniel chapter two, verse twenty one. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. Someone read that for us. Uh, I tell you what. Begin at verse 20, please. And this was at a time when Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar asked something that nobody else had asked. You remember what it was? You remember Daniel chapter 2, right? Sure you do. Yes, he asked him to interpret a dream. Now who can interpret somebody's dream? Only God. And what did the king threaten them with? He threatened them with death if they couldn't interpret it. So, and, and what happened? Uh, Daniel and the Hebrew boys, what did they do? They prayed. And who gave them an answer? God gave them the answer. Okay? And the king spared them. So therefore the king knew that there was a God. Uh, among the Gentiles, they knew. Yes. Uh, 
Exactly. Exactly. That was a terrible part. And then you're going to kill us on top of it if we don't? My goodness. But anyway, the point being here, again, is that God is in charge. That If we get nothing out of this lesson today, that you be encouraged. God is still in, in charge. Turn to verse 37. Uh, same chapter, verse 37. Chapter 2, Daniel 2. Verse 37. Uh, verse 36, 37. Yes, verse 36 and 37. Amen. Kings, God has set up these kings. And he's letting Nebuchadnezzar know, Nebuchadnezzar, it ain't because of all of you. Okay? He set you up. And Nebuchadnezzar would find later when he was all full of himself that he wasn't all that. And he came back to realize that God was in charge. Um, uh, drop down again to verse... Let's go this time to chapter 4, Daniel, chapter 4, verse 17. Okay. What does that say to you? Take a look at that again. What does that say? There's a lot of good points in there. But I think sometimes we lose sight of some of, some of them. Um, and it's a good time to be refreshed about it. Look at verse 37. What does it say to you? Somebody want to share? He gives positions? He does. And take a look at that last verse. Uh-huh. Who are not high and mighty. That's a good way of putting it. The one I would really concentrate on, he gives it to anyone. I'm reading the... Um, Yes, he gives it to the lowest of men. So, so think about that. We see men that we don't think are too smart. We don't think they're very bright. All the dots are not connecting. That sounds sometimes like what I see in Congress. <laughs> and yet, it says, how did they get there? So I think sometimes we have to remember Who's still in control? He puts them there. We talked about promotion comes not from the east or the west. God promotes people and he exalts people. And so we see here that he says he, he even puts in the lowliest of men over the affairs of men. And, and it's evident. We can see that because we just look at the world. And we see what's going on in Syria. You know, people dying and killing uh, over there, or his own people. And we've seen that in other places in the world where we've sent our own troops there to fight. And, of course, we can see it here in our own government. Uh, drop down to verse 32. We're at... Um, Daniel chapter 4, verse 32.
Okay. Um, God does the giving. He does. He's the one who puts people in charge. Again, we see. Um, and then turn to verses 34 and 35. Daniel 4, verses 34 and 35. Amen. 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 God is the sovereign God. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. And and he tells us that for these leaders, what what is our responsibility? To pray for them. To pray for them. Okay. Um we're going, to take, we're going to take a look at uh, number two in the book where it says, God instituted government as a representative of his authority. Somebody have a question? Matter of fact, I want to take a look. I want to take a look in the short time we have left. Romans chapter 13, verse 4. If you turn there with us. And I want to read, beginning... I'm going to just read beginning of verse uh, chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. And I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so it may be a little bit different than yours. Thank you. That's good. One thing I want you to look at is uh, verse 4. And in verse 4, I believe in your Bibles it may use the word minister. Does anybody have a different word? Romans chapter 13 verse 4 says, For... He is the minister of God to thee for good. That word is used twice in that verse. And the first time it's used is the word diakonos. You remember what that word means? Servant. What other word we get, what other word we get from that? Deacons. What did deacons do? They serve. Well, guess what this is saying? If we go back and read it, it says, For government is God's servant. For your good. This government that we have is to be our servant. 
It doesn't always look like that, but that's the way it's supposed to be. That's what God says. It's our servant. And it says, but if you. But if you do wrong, be afraid because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For government is God's servant. And that's a different Greek word. An avenger that brings wrath to the one who does wrong. But the point that, that I want to make here was that the, the law is uh, and government is to be our servant. Um, and as a servant, you don't uh, you don't get served. You serve. You serve others. And so the authorities of God's servant uh, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid. For they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants. Uh, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. We're going to, I see our time is up. We're going to uh, continue next, um, in, the, in the next session. We'll continue. Continue to study uh, in the book on page uh, 207 and uh, 208. And uh, next time we get together, we'll go, to, we'll go to that part of the role of the church in the civil government. Father God, we are grateful and give you praise because you are still on the throne. And no matter what we may be going through, we know we can seek your face and you hear us. And so, Father, we thank you uh, for, for our government. We realize it's not the best, but we also realize that you're in charge. And we pray that uh, we would be praying for our leaders. We pray that you would help them to function as you designed your government to function. And we pray that um, uh, for our particular government that uh, the leaders in the Congress can, um, can get their minds together and reopen the government, that those who depend on it uh, can be served and um, uh, for many uh, uh, have businesses that are being hurt by the shutdown. So, Father, we pray that also that they will learn to spend the money wisely so that we don't spend what we don't have. And we pray that you would uh, help the government and our leaders to reconcile those issues. Uh, we just thank you for your blessings this morning. And thank you for each one. Father, we pray that you would encourage each one to look to you for our help. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.